Let's look at some period accounts of Chinese swordsmanship in the age of Queen Victoria. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gully Torah and Eastern Antique Arms. Now, I have spoken about Chinese swordsmanship, um, in fact, a number of times in the past. Um, I have practiced Kung Fu in my past, but I'm not by any means an expert on Chinese swordsmanship or martial arts in general. However, I am an antique sword dealer and a number of antique swords have come through my hands over the years. And indeed, I am very lucky to be able to review um, the great swords that come out of LK Chen's workshop as well. This is an example of a Qing Dynasty um, Dao of a type used in the 19th century of the sources we're going to look at in this video. Now, the first thing to mention is that I haven't given a lot of examples of period accounts of swordsmanship in the various uh, campaigns in China, uh, largely because there isn't very much source material. Now, this is something which is conspicuously absent, and we don't really know exactly why it is. Certainly, if we look at British sources of their activities in India or the Sudan or Egypt, or South Africa, or Afghanistan, there's absolutely loads of combat accounts. And I've recited many of these in previous videos. But for China, we're left with actually not very much source material of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, this raises the obvious question of simply, was there not very much hand-to-hand -hand combat in the campaigns in China? What were, where are the first-hand combat accounts from these invasions of China? When we have plenty of them from things like uh, India and Afghanistan and Sudan and the aforementioned places, Egypt and so on. But given that this is a video actually looking at first-hand combat accounts um, or descriptions of close combat and use of swords, for example, in China in these wars, we do have some source material to present you. Now, this is with huge thanks and gratitude to Rami Bairi, who is a follower of the channel, watcher of my videos, uh, and also, I would say, assistant to the channel uh, now, because he has come up with some primary source material for the use of um, swords in China during the 19th century um, in British sources uh, that I had not seen before. So uh, kudos to Rami, thanks for providing that, and you should all thank him as well, um, because that's why this video is coming to you now. So the wars principally in question here are split into three. They are the First Opium War, the Second Opium War, and the so-called Boxer rebellion. Uh, the first Opium War was from uh, 1839 to 42, I believe. The second Opium War was uh, 56, 1856 to 1860 with the Battle of the Taku Forts and all of that, so straight after the Indian Mutiny. And um, the uh, Boxer Rebellion wasn't just a, a British endeavour, it was uh, with a huge sort of confederation army of colonial powers. Um, it should also be noted that the Second War involved the French. Uh, so the first one was pretty much a British um, uh, endeavour. The second one was an Anglo-French endeavour. Uh, the, the British and the French were getting on OK at this point, um, largely as a result of the Crimean War and some shared colonial interests. And then uh, by the end of the 19th century, 1900, um, the Boxer Rebellion, there were many different colonial powers who had interests in exerting their gunboat diplomacy on China. So all of these wars were pretty horrible. I'm not going to get into the politics of them. Uh, by modern standards or any standards, uh, they're completely reprehensible. But nevertheless, they do provide interesting history to study for us. So referring to the first opium war, the first account says, In other houses, numbers of poor creatures were found dead, some by their own hands or the hands of each other, and the rest by the hands of their husbands. So this is people committing suicide um, rather than uh, being taken prisoner or um, uh, invaded. Um, in one house, no less than 14 dead bodies were discovered, principally women. In others, the men began to cut their own throats the moment that they saw any of our soldiers approaching. While in other instances, they rushed out furiously from some hiding place and attacked with the sword anyone who came in their way. This is where the interesting part for us comes in. Um, several of our officers had to defend their lives with the sword, this is British officers, long after any systematic um, opposition had ceased. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. That's a really interesting point and something which with 19th century sources we really need to emphasise and that is very often hand-to-hand -hand combat was not something that necessarily happened during a battle or during a main action. It was often during the mopping up afterwards or skirmishing beforehand. And very often the sources that we have to rely on focus on the main 
battles, the main big actions with artillery and everything else big going on, and actually to find the hand-to-hand -hand combat accounts, we actually need to look at things like um, policing uh, operations uh, or chasing down people who'd, um, enemies who'd fled from a battle after defeat and things like this. So uh, quite often the hand-to-hand -hand combat accounts aren't in the mainstream sources. It goes on, it says an officer of the 14th MNI, which is Madras Native Infantry, had a combat with three Tartars. I'll stop there again for a second. So what is an officer of the 14th Madras Native Infantry? At this time, the Madras Native Infantry, or pretty much any Indian Army uh, Native Infantry, consisted of Indian soldiers with uh, Indian NCOs, corporals and sergeants, Indian officers, and British officers. And what they're referring to here is probably a British officer, although technically it could also be an Indian officer. Um, and Tatars are Mongols, essentially. It's another name for Mongols. Um, so, but this is complicated by the fact that at this time, sometimes um, certain groups of Chinese who maybe may or may not have been uh, Mongols or Tatars were sometimes referred to as Tatars if they were dressed or equipped in a certain way by the British. So they appeared to this source to be Tatars. Um, uh, had a combat with three Tatars who rushed out upon him, sword in hand, so they all had swords, and by retreating so as to endeavour to take them singly. Very good advice, that's featured in uh, Dobringer's treatise all the way back in 1389. Uh, you run away until the fastest one catches up, and then you hit them, then you run away again, and then you hit the next one, and so forth. He was able to cut down two of them just when a fatal blow was about to be aimed at him by the third. So he managed to kill two by himself, which is really good going, but was probably going to um, fall to the third. Um, who, and that third, who was fortunately shot at the very critical moment by a soldier coming up to his officer's assistance. In this case, the soldier would have been um, a uh, Madras native infantry, sepoy as they were called, Indian soldier. Um, so there we go, an interesting account where we've got Tartars. Now I should also mention, in other period accounts from the 1840s, we see the Tartars, as they're referred to in these sources, as actually being equipped with bows and what many of us would you know, kind of think of as, as kind of medieval weapons. So they're mounted on horses, they're sometimes wearing armour, a form of sometimes lamella, sometimes brigandine type construction armour. Um, yeah, they're armed with swords like this, forms of doubt usually, and they're armed with bows and arrows. And there are some accounts that actually talk about the psychological effect on European soldiers of being shot at with arrows, which they weren't used to at all. They were used to standing in front of musketry, but they weren't used to arrows um, that they could see coming towards them. So different psychological effect. But anyway, a very interesting source and evidence that indeed there were sword encounters uh, in these wars in China, but not always within the mainstream kind of battles or sieges that happened. Here we have another account from the same period. Um, so it starts, they now observed that a very short distance in advance, two Chinese officers of high rank, generals or something like that, on horseback were endeavouring to make their escape, surrounded by numerous bodyguard or retinue. Makes sense. The opportunity for trying to take an important prisoner was a tempting one, and Captain Hall, little thinking how few of his own men were near him, and carried away by the impulse of the moment, rushed headlong upon the Chinese soldiers in front of him, firing his pistols, important pistols, so he's got at least two pistols, probably two, a brace of pistols as it was called. These would have been, uh, at this date, percussion lock, probably, percussion lock, uh, single shot pistols. They could have been double barreled, but probably single barreled. Um, firing his pistols at the two principal officers. Only two of his own men were near him at that moment. Oops. <laughs> Um, so that one of the inferior Chinese officers, seeing the disparity, rallied a few of his men and suddenly faced about, turned about, with a, with a view to cut them off. <laughs> I bet they did. A personal encounter now took place with the Chinese officer, who was a remarkably fine young man, and bearing the white button, which I presume is some sign of a graduation or um, excellence, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know what that relates to, but obviously a sign of um, being important. The long sword, however, that means the European officer's sword. The long sword, however, soon had the advantage over the short Chinese short one. Now, Rami and I had a discussion about what that means. The Chinese 
short sword probably refers to a form of gen which was popular in the 19th century and worn by sometimes civilians sometimes officers uh, but to denote your being of sort of higher station in society. And this type of sword often features a blade of as little as, as 26 inches in length, um, whereas a European officer's sword has a blade of 32 or 33 inches, uh, if they're infantry and if they're cavalry up to 35 or 36 inches. So, in comparative blade length, I mean, even if the Chinese officer actually had a dao like this, this might have a this might have a 32 inch blade. But then I don't think we'd be referring to a short sword. So I think from this description, it's probably a jian, probably of about 26, 27 inch blade. So, you know, half a foot shorter than the European officer's sword. The longsword, however, soon had the advantage over the Chinese short one, even putting aside personal prowess, so that suggests that the Chinese swordsman was better. And the Mandarin, the Chinese officer, fell, severely wounded in the arm. So non-fatal, okay? It makes sense if you've got a longer weapon um, that you'd be able to snipe the arm without risk to your own arm. He was immediately disarmed, um, so taken away of his sword, and his cap and button, together with his sword, were taken from him as trophies. This was a common way that things like Chinese swords ended up back in Britain in the 19th century. Several other soldiers now came up to endeavour to rescue their officer, the Chinese officer, who got up and tried to escape. But another wound in the leg soon brought him down again, so presumably from the sword, they don't actually say, and made the other Chinamen halt. By this time, Captain Hall and his two men were nearly surrounded by the Chinese and were compelled to fight their way back again uh, towards their comrades. Now, they don't actually say here, but the implication, his men would have had, uh, at this date, muskets and bayonets. So the implication is maybe they fired, it doesn't mention them firing. So probably he's using his sword, they're using their bayonets to try and get back towards um, their friends. Um, uh, to get back towards their comrades, who were coming up to their aid. One of the two seamen, so that's interesting, so uh, Captain Hall therefore appears to me to be a naval officer, and the first time we've got that clue, um, possibly, possibly not, maybe they just had seamen in assistance, but anyway, one of the two seamen received a severe wound in the groin from the thrust of a spear, so there were spears involved as well but the others got off without any injury. The young wounded Mandarin was at last safely carried off by his comrades. So the Chinese officer who was wounded in the arm and the leg did manage to get away um, and probably would have recovered from his wounds, relatively minor wounds from a sword. So there we have an interesting account. Again, it's not in a major battle or anything like this. It's kind of things happening on the fringes of the main activity before or after skirmishing, you know, these types of things, um, where we actually see hand-to-hand -hand combat absolutely happened. Yes, there was shooting involved, but in many cases, with a musket, for example, you fired your musket, you don't have time in that situation to reload it. You've got to use the bayonet. The officer, he fired off both his pistols, but then he's got to rely on his sword. So before the age of multi-shot uh, firearms, really, you know, bayonets and swords are still very, very important, especially in this type of situation where you might be outnumbered or you might be further away from your allied lines. It's also worth noting from a historian perspective as well that this source in particular is not disparaging of the Chinese. It doesn't describe them in derogatory terms. And in fact, quite to the contrary, although of course this partly elevates the um, achievements of the, of the British forces, it complements the enemy swordsman on his skill. So in this particular source, it puts down the Chinese swordsman's um, defeat to the fact that he had an inferior weapon, a shorter sword. Uh, and it implies, in fact, it states that he was the superior swordsman, in fact. Now, I should just mention that these two sources were taken from the book called The Nemesis in China, comprising a history of the late war in that country with a complete account of the colony of Hong Kong by William Dallas Bernard. So here we have another account actually talking about the arms and equipment uh, of the Chinese in this particular um, conflict and indeed another anecdotal story um, about something that happened. So it says, the strength of the Chinese army was estimated at from seven to 8,000 men, part of which appeared to be a picked body, um, bodyguard, said to belong to the emperor's guard. They were fine, athletic, powerful men. It was also remarked that their arms, weapons, were of a superior kind. Now, 
It should be noted as an antique dealer, 19th century Chinese weapons are often of really quite poor mass-produced quality. They were usually owned by the government, um, held in state arsenals, as I understand it, and they were given out to levied troops. So a lot of the Chinese army were poor quality troops with poor quality weapons, but these are talking about superior bodyguards with superior weapons. Several improvements had been adopted, and the bow and arrow, once the favourite weapon of the Tatar soldier, had been laid aside on this occasion. As usual, several personal account encounters took place. Now, this is a really, that, just that one part of a sentence is very, very interesting, because as usual, several personal encounters took place. That means hand-to-hand -hand combats between individuals, duels almost. Um, now, it's really frustrating in a way because it, it, says, it says this, but where are all the accounts? We just don't have all these numerous accounts from the campaigns in China like we do from India, Afghanistan, Sudan, and so, so on and so forth, which is a shame. Um, but nevertheless, we've got a few, so here they are. Um, so yes, a few personal encounters took place. The Chinese, not fearing to engage single-handed with their foe or to measure their sword with that of our officers, so two important things there to note. So first of all, the Chinese, um, particularly officers it seems, were quite keen to have duels with European officers. But again, we've got a mention of swords size or length. And it does seem, and we know, British officers carried a regulation blade of 32 and a half inches on paper for infantry officers. Very occasionally this was 33 or a little bit longer, but that therefore tells us that the Chinese officers' swords, Jian, I think, were shorter. Um, uh, in one of these combats, Mr. Hodgson, um, mate of the Cornwallis, Cornwallis so he's uh, from a, um, a ship, um, was wounded not far from the Admiral. Colonel Mountain, <laughs> brilliant name, Colonel Mountain, Colonel Mountain was in some danger of being run through, uh, stabbed, um, but was saved by a timely shot from one of the 18th, <laughs> who I guess is the 18th uh, Madras Native Infantry. Uh, the clothes of the slain were in some instances ignited by their matches, um, so they were using matchlock uh, firearms with a burning um, f uh, match, essentially, and this unfortunately would sometimes set uh, set fire to them, uh, and produced as um, as on some other occasions a revolting spectacle. Yes, I bet it did. Um, the night was passed by our gallant little force in the tents from which the Chinese had been driven. So they took the Chinese tents after driving them off. Um, and which were found to contain plenty of warm coverings and provisions. Well, wasn't that nice? So there we go. Again, it's just kind of alluding to, we don't have a huge number of very detailed kind of meaty sources uh, like we do from various campaigns in, in India, for example. Uh, which is a shame, but it's something. And it just again goes to kind of inform us that they this hand-to-hand -hand combat was going Going on, it was just a relatively short war, not a lot was written about it, and so therefore there's a, a lack of source material. But there's enough there to show us that it was happening. So thanks again to Rami for coming up with these um, sources, none of those which I have seen previously. There is one final source to share with you, which Rami also shared with me, which I have seen previously, but which I'd forgotten about. Um, and this is from, and you have to excuse the title of this, it's very much of its period, The Uncivilised Races of Men in All Countries of the World by the British naturalist John George, published in 1876. Um, so the title very much of its time, but actually this book contains a lot of interesting observations from this person's travels and, and observations of different uh, cultural groups. Particularly he talks about their weapons, which is why I've seen the book before, because when I've been researching cookeries, for example, uh, or the Korg knife and various other things, they come up um, in this person's works. So I have seen those things before, but I hadn't really taken an awful lot of uh, notice of what it says about Chinese weapons. But it does say something interesting about Chinese weapons of the time, in this case being 1876. So it says, of swords, the Chinese have an abundant variety. Well, yeah, I guess that's true. I would say that there's not as many different types of Chinese sword as there are Indian sword, but nevertheless, they, you know, there's, there's Jian, uh, there's um, Dao of various types, there's things like butterfly knives, and so on and so forth. Some are single-handed swords, yes, that's true. And there is one device by which two swords are carried in the same sheath. 
and are used one in each hand. Well, now, the funny thing is here is that there isn't actually only one type of Chinese sword where you have two in one sheath. We actually find Chinese um, Dao, sometimes configured like this, where the guard is a hemi-circle, a half-circle rather, on one side and half-circle on the other. The grip is halved up here and you can draw two Dao out of one scabbard. Equally, you get exactly the same thing, but with a Jian. Usually the Jian, that's certainly the antique ones I've seen and handled, um, are relatively short bladed, usually only about 25, 26 inch blades, um, but they are straight double-edged swords. Again, both the swords contained in one scabbard and the, uh, the guard and the grip and the pommel are um, a, a half circle so they fit together so at first sight it looks like one sword in the scabbard which I suspect is part of the trick kind of haha I actually have two um, and of course we get exactly the same thing with butterfly knives as well so so this writer talking about the Chinese sword that comes in 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 half essentially in two swords in one uh, scabbard and is disguised in a sense could be referring to any of those or all of those. I, ju I just don't know from what he's written. So it could be a Dao, could be a Jian, could be uh, so-called butterfly knives. Um, and he goes on to say, I have seen the two sword exercise, so dual wielding, two sword exercise performed and can understand that when opposed to any person not acquainted with the weapon, the Chinese swordsman would be irresistible, <laughs> irresistible, impossible to beat. Um, but in spite of the two swords, which fly about the wielder's head like the sails of a mill. <laughs> so he's describing lots of circular motions, pretty much like we see in lots of Kung Fu exercises uh, today. Um, and the agility with which the Chinese fencer, interesting that to a European at the time, they just call that Chinese fencing. They don't call it Kung Fu, they just call it Chinese fencing. In the same way that they called uh, people doing Wing Chun and stuff like this, they called them boxers hence the Boxer Rebellion. Um, so the Chinese fencer leaps about and presents first one side and then the other to his antagonist enemy. Um, I cannot but think that any ordinary fencer would be, a, would be able to keep himself out of reach and also to get in his point to thrust in spite of the whirling blades of his adversary. Um, so, you know, Make of that what you what you may. I mean, he's, this is someone who's obviously seen this firsthand, a, a display of the two sword uh, exercise. Uh, whether it, what type of sword it was, we don't know. Uh, but again, we have the uh, reference to um, sort of the size of the swords as well. Um, so there we go. That's that's all I've got for you today. Um, I will keep looking, and I'm sure Rami Bari will also keep looking for more Chinese sources from the 19th century, or, well, rather British sources describing Chinese weapons and uh, martial arts and swords. And if we find them, we'll come back to you with a follow-up to this video. But I hope this has been interesting, and I hope to see you back on the channel. Thanks again to Rami. See you soon, folks.